I am uh, sorry we're beginning a little late. I'm just coming in from a keynote from the next room. And uh, we will be having uh, this panel, which uh, of course you are aware it's an accessible and inclusive ICT solution, uh, bridging the gap. Um, we have uh, an announcement. Uh, my, uh, I, will, I will make a brief introduction of nine minutes, and then each one of the panelists will have nine minutes to explain his PowerPoint. We have a time controller, which I will present to you. She has a gadget, I don't know what you call this, a, a, light, a light system by which she will explain the lights to all the speakers, and that I will avoid me any sending papers to clarify their time. So if you may, Madam, can you please explain the coloring? Good morning, everybody. This light, um, is about is, is for the speaking for the speakers and it, it, every speaker has the time for about nine minutes the first five minutes the traffic will be green after that the, the yellow light will be th for three minutes and after one minute the yellow light will come uh, light up and a signal will be to here thank you very much Okay, thank you. Um, I would like uh, to just mention who is on our extraordinary panel here. Uh, before I begin, uh, I have Francisca Cesa Bianchi, who is the Institutional Relations for G3ICT. Uh, Francisca is very well known to all of us. Francisca, if you would please stand up so they can see you. Frederick Schroeder Ubu from the World Blind Union on the advocacy work of WBU in the Digital Accessibility for the Blind. Yes? yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Christopher M. Lee, uh, our International Association on Accessibility Professionals and Program Chair at G3ICT uh, for Inclusive Higher Education. Vasta Bracharji, Bracharji, I hope yes. I, 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 yes. Um, a21 access to information on his experience and success in promoting the adoption of accessible digital books through activism, technology, and innovation. Tieram Kenny, Wi Fi to here to my right, on indoor audio navigation, on the development of indoor audio navigation and pioneering work at Wayfinder. Wayfinder. Yes. Um, Susan Lauren, CEO Funka NUAB. Susan, I'm sorry I, 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 I used your chair. Uh, Shadi Jawu Sharara, W3C. Thank you very much. Shadi, you're, 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 you're a good friend of ours. He's from the World Wide Web Consortium. And Jake Adma from ING Bank. Jake is also a very good friend. This is a G3 ICT panel, as you will very well see, but we have other friends, like Hiroshi here, who is also one of our senior advisors. So if I go around the room, I would probably have many more who have collaborated with G3 ICT. Maculada back there is, is, is part of our, our team. G3 ICT, uh, and uh, we, we are missing the key, the, key pers the key player in this, whose name is Axel Lebois. Um, uh, I will tell you a story of mine with Axel Lebois in, in use of my nine minutes. Uh, I was ambassador of Ecuador to the, to the United States and uh, a, a gentleman called Axel Lebois asked to see me. I had been the chairman of the, of the working group that uh, elaborated the, the convention, the CRPD, from 2002 to 2005. And Axel visited me in Washington and said, um, would you be would you be uh, kind enough to join us in an initiative of a global compact for inclusive ICTs on the basis of Article 9 of the Convention? And uh, I said, yes, I, I, I would be very happy to collaborate with you on the basis that this be volunteer work. So uh, we began with Axel uh, a, a, an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, uh, voyage uh, I don't see Francis West here because Francis, oh, here, Francis West. Francis uh, and I and a group of complotees met in the, in, in the dungeons of the UN in, 
in, in, in New York. I call them the jun dungeons because they said these smaller rooms in the bottom. So we had this, this, this room where people from IBM, uh, 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 Francis was the vice president of technology and accessibility of IBM and others. We met in this room and uh, we suggested that we formulate a working group and an organization to foster the use of uh, information and communication technology for persons with disabilities. This was the year 2006 and it was before, uh, some days before the approval of the CRPD by the General Assembly. Uh, uh, the General Assembly approved this on the 13th of December of 2006. I just made a crack at the other session because that's my birthday. So, you know, it was the best gift the General Assembly could give me was a, a, the, 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 the approval of the convention, which has been the most successful convention in the history of human rights in the United Nations. It is signed by 175 countries, signed and ratified, and it has been the first human rights treaty of this century, but the most successful one because it covers the human rights of one billion persons who have disability and their stakeholders and uh, their, their, the stakeholders of this organization, their families, which I believe are the numbers of three billion plus. And of course, as we age, we, we will be disabled, so we're covering many billions of people who, whose lives have been touched by this convention and will continue to be as activism moves the convention to formulate new strides and new, road new roads for disability. Um, I have a set of slides which I will be very fast for, uh, lo looking forward. So um, Francisca has, uh, has the control of the slides, if, if, she, if I, or someone has the control of my slides. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I think I, I, I told you most of, the, of these issues, but of course G3I has been a partner of the Zero Project since the inception of the uh, uh, of Zero Project. We have collaborated in many fields and our experts have collaborated with them. This is an organization uh, uh, based in, in Atlanta, a nonprofit that has an, an extensive experience all over the world. It basically, as I said, covers Article 9, but all the other pertinent uh, uh, articles on accessibility. Uh, with, uh, with TPI and IDA, G3ICT um, covered a, a, a study which uh, fundamentally says that we, the, the, there are the legal frameworks, the, 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 there's a legal framework for, for this. I will wait until they put up the slide because uh, I, I talk, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you as if you are seeing the slides in back of me, which I can't see in front of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Technology has glitches too. So. <laughs> okay, we are finding that what we we signed a joint decennial call for the next ten years after the tenth during the tenth anniversary of the convention. What we would like is web accessibility, TV and audiovisual accessibility mobile communication services accessibility, e-books and digital content accessibility, internet usage by persons with disability, inclusive ITCs for education, enabling ITTs for all employment, e-government and smart cities for all, enabling assistive technologies <coughs> and ICT for independent living and procurement for accessible public goods and services. Um, each one of these is a profound subject, but I'll just touch on the last one so you will understand this. Governments and societies buy huge quantities of ICT hardware and technology. What we want is that there be a streamlining of that to make them all accessible when they buy them. If a multilateral like the World Bank is going to finance the buying of computers for schools in a country. We would prefer that it be preconditioned to be accessible and not the other way around where they buy computers and they're not accessible so you have to spend more money to make them accessible. So it sounds very logical to us. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound very logical to politicians and policymakers because we're having no success. So this is where you come in. We, we need your backing to do this. 
Uh, okay, do we have any slides? No. So, um, um, Ambassador, yes. they are coming from the They're coming. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I am slowly eating up my nine minutes. Okay. The, the, we have worked in over 70 countries as G3 ICT, and the last, uh, the last 12 countries we worked in is India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Egypt, South Africa, Mexico, Colombia, Turkey, Dominican Republic, and Myanmar. Uh, I say that with a profound, uh, a profound uh, orgul, uh, pride, because this organization, which began with a group of people, uh, pra practically five, has extended itself to a worldwide organization that has agreements with ITU. I see my friends from ITU also here. We have had a, uh, we have an agreement with ITU, and we have worked very, very in intensively with them. We have a, 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 an agreement with UNESCO and with another group of uh, half a dozen organizations. We are a contributor to the Committee on the Human Rights of Persons with Disabilities in the, in the UN system, and we have worked also with the Council of Human Rights. Um, the objective is to make ITCs available for persons with disabilities in all realms of life. Uh, it is a joint venture between uh, an organization and nonprofits and civil society, the DPOs, both IDA and uh, DPI and other organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, we produce a, a document every, every two years on the compliance of over 120 countries with the Convention on the Accessibility of ITCs. We are not happy with what we are finding. Uh, we prefer not to ask governments, we ask civil society to do the measuring and we find that we have a very, very long road to go. Um, but I'm an optimist. I come from a country uh, whose president is a person with a disability, and in technology, uh, we have more cell phones than people. So if Ecuador can have more cell phones than people, I, uh, I would, uh, I would answer your question that technology is there and we must use and exploit it to the best of our knowledge to make our societies more accessible, more equal, and more inclusive. I will end there, and I will probably uh, end when the, when the slide comes up, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're all having fun with that. But I would like to continue then with the next speaker on my list, which is Francisca Chesa Blanchi, which is trying to get her slides on the board. Francisca, you are on. Ten, nine minutes? Yeah. Thank you. Please, follow my example. Thank you, Ambassador Gallegos, uh, uh, for um, your introduction. And, uh, well, the slides we can maybe find the time. Uh, there were overview slides with some resources about G3 ICT, uh, but Ambassador <coughs> Gallegos already explained most of our work, so uh, they will remain available anyway for review if we don't have time to, to show them. But uh, um, what I'm here today to talk about is a specific project that we are about to launch. Um, at G3 ICT, uh, and uh, I would like to um, uh, start with uh, um, some <laughs> slides myself. <laughs> uh, so this project is called the DARE Index. Um, it's a, actually a project, a survey that G3 ICT has been working in collaboration with the DPI, the Disabled Peoples International. And uh, they are index uh, means Digital Accessibility Rights Evaluation Index. It's basically a survey of 121 countries that we have uh, done, representing about 89% of the world's population. And the uh, respondents of, of our surveys are actually advocates, uh, persons with disability, uh, researchers, community leaders identified in partnership with uh, Disabled Peoples International, RIADIS, and other uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, we do have, uh, we have uh, s about seven years of history uh, data that uh, comes prior to the DARE index. 
um, with the CRPD progress report, uh, we have published a number of those, uh, but we decided to shift to a real index right now. <laughs> so I give you uh, some good news that comes out for, from the research is that about 84% of countries globally uh, have now a constitutional article, law, or regulation defining uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. A second good news that we have um, uh, that is coming out from the DARE index is that 64% of countries globally have a definition of reasonable accommodation included in a law regulation regarding the rights of persons with disabilities. And that's very important because um, denial of reasonable uh, uh, accommodation is actually a form of discrimination and uh, the notion is, uh, has been uh, an important notion in the CRPD and has been subject of much debate. So this is a great accomplishment globally. Um, good news number three is that 51% of countries globally have aligned their definition of accessibility with Article 9 of the CRPD by including ICT or electronic media in the country laws and regulation. And then a fourth good news is that 48% of the country globally have a definition of accessibility in their laws or regulation, including ICT. So we went from very few uh, countries prior to the CRPD adoption to now 48% of countries globally. And this is another important uh, definition because um, if there is no accessibility uh, definition, of course, there is no legal foundation to uh, push for web accessibility or uh, accessibility of ITMs or so. So as you see, as there is a positive evolution of legislation in support of ICT accessibility, uh, we are now looking at how much of an impact on the availability of accessible ICT there is in the world. And uh, here is actually a, a graph that represents a country actual implementation of accessible ICT averages by income level. Uh, this represents the 10 key areas by country and by economic uh, development, TV, public procurement, ICT and ICT for independent living, web accessibility, e-government and smart cities, enabling ICT for employment, inclusive ICT for education, promotion of internet usage by persons with disabilities, mobile and e-books. And uh, you can see uh, the scale is actually from zero, so no policy or program, to five, which is full implementation. And uh, here you can see some interesting um, uh, uh, results, uh, findings actually, because for example, uh, high income countries um, are in a scale for uh, web accessibility and TV about two, so uh, between two and three program deployed, but with limited reach or impact. So we're still, this gives us uh, give a, an outlook of the country's uh, implementation average by, by income. Um, here we have actually uh, the list of countries which are halfway, uh, more than halfway actually on implementation, countries with the 25 on 50 score uh, or greater for ICT accessibility implementation and outcomes. Um, I can read this, the list of, uh, we are going from Ireland, 25 on 50, Australia 26, Spain 27, France 27, United Kingdom 28, South Africa 28 and Italy 28 as well as Israel and then Brazil 29, United States 30, Qatar 30, and Oman 31 on 50, on a score of 50. So this is actually the, uh, the ICT implementation and outcomes. And uh, we have um, just Austria and Norway are about 23. Uh, on 50, and Sweden is about uh, 20 on 50. And then I'll explain a bit more. Um, but um, we are posting all these uh, uh, countries on our website, and uh, of course this is, our, is available for observations and for more validation. This is a really, we want to um, publish this in index uh, as a grass, uh, grassroots, and um, the validation process is, is a bit grassroots grassroot and crowdsourced. So we are looking at observations by uh, local advocates in each country. And this is how we get these results. 
Um, further on, the top three countries for implementation and ICT accessibility outcomes by level of income. Um, I can read them again. It's high income countries. Uh, we have Oman, Qatar, and United States uh, in the list. Upper middle income countries, Brazil, South Africa, Russian Federation. Lower middle income countries, Egypt, Kenya, Philippines. Low income countries, Haiti, Malawi, and Togo. So here you have uh, these um, uh, uh, top three countries, basically, for each type of implementation. Uh, so sorry, for each level of um, income. So how the uh, their index work, uh, it will be posted on our new uh, website, which will coming up soon in March. We are completing uh, the um, validation process for about 10 countries of the 121 that we have been observing. And uh, here you will find, uh, this is an example on uh, Jamaica, we took one example. Uh, so this is uh, where you will find in the DARE index. Um, so uh, basically a, a review of key country facts, but then commitments, uh, country capacity to implement, uh, country cap policy and programs out outcomes by ICT areas of accessibility and level of implementation, and then some score summaries as well. And this is uh, plus other information like publications and country organization involved in disability and accessibility, and there will be also some index score and global rankings as well. So the, this gives you an idea what you will find, for example, in, in terms of commitments, which are country laws and regulation. So we assign uh, five points on 25. For example, if the country has assigned the convention, the country will get five points on five. If it has ratified, five points on five. If it has a general law uh, protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, then again, five on five, and so on and so forth. So, okay. <laughs> you will find all this, and uh, um, as well as, should I <laughs> close? <laughs> well, capacity to implement uh, is the same. I let you uh, then browse into our website presentation first and our website uh, when we will pu publish this very soon. Uh, and um, these are some of the conclusions uh, that I want to make is that very briefly, uh, commitments and capacity to implement determine actual outcomes. So it's very important to notice that. And the DARE index allows to assess the level of maturity of countries uh, in promoting ICT accessibility and to spot opportunities to fill gaps. And last but not least, early success stories, like I see here our good friends from Finascol, Henry Mejia, for example, uh, who will, uh, I think, has, uh, speak about Colombia has one of the best relay services. It's a success story in Colombia. And I just want to conclude with that, saying that early success story in implementation in country of various levels of economic development show that ICT accessibility is achievable in all sectors. So, and this is how I want to conclude. This is the DARE Index dashboard with all the countries that you will find. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francisca. Uh, my, the next speaker is Frederick Schroeder from WBU. Please, Mr. Schroeder. Thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You have the slides? Okay, so slide one background of the World Blind Union. I'm not adept with technology, so Stephanie Steinbauer has kindly agreed to help me. The World Blind Union represents the estimated 253 million blind and partially sighted people in the world. Our members represent consumer organizations of blind people and service providing agencies in 190 countries. The World Blind Union works to advance the social and economic integration of blind people into society, and that, of course, begins with children. 
Blind children suffer lack of access to education, leading to high levels of unemployment as adults. This creates a life cycle of isolation and poverty. Next, uh, next slide, please. Blind people and others with print disabilities have access to fewer than 5% of published works, fewer than 1% in the developing world. The digital revolution offers the potential to greatly expand access to print. However, national copyright laws do not permit the cross-border sharing of accessible works. In response, in 2008, the WBU launched its Right to Read campaign. The campaign called for a treaty to address what the WBU described as the book famine for the blind. Next slide, please. In 2013, the World Intellectual Property Organization adopted the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. The treaty calls on countries to modify their national copyright laws to permit the production of accessible works, and the treaty authorizes the cross-border sharing of accessible works. Importantly, the treaty also permits the direct distribution of accessible materials to individuals. This is critical for people who live in very poor countries that may not have libraries or schools for the blind to manage distribution. Next slide, please. Refreshable braille devices, that is mechanical braille generated by computer-driven pins, allow blind people to read electronic text in Braille. While refreshable Braille devices have been available for decades, cost has been a limiting factor. Most electronic Braille devices cost in excess of 5,000 US dollars. In 2012, the WBU launched an initiative to develop a low-cost Braille display, one that would be under 500 US dollars or one-tenth the cost of previous technology. The initiative was called Transforming Braille and resulted in the development of a product known as the Orbit Reader. Next slide, please. The Marrakesh Treaty permits countries that have ratified the treaty to exchange accessible materials in accessible formats across national borders. The most cost-effective way to share accessible works is through the exchange of electronic files. But to read electronic text, the blind person must have access to technology such as the Orbit Reader. The advent of low-cost, refreshable Braille devices, together with the ability to share accessible materials across national borders, has opened the possibility of education for the world's poorest blind children. Next slide, please. UNESCO estimates that children with, that 98 percent of children with disabilities who live in developing countries are not in school. But the Marrakesh Treaty, together with the Orbit Reader, can open the door to education. For the cost of a single hard copy Braille book, the Orbit Reader will give blind children and adults access to literally thousands of books. Ex uh, accessible books can be stored on inexpensive thumb drives, and for people who have internet access, they can be downloaded directly. 
Next slide, please. But there are challenges. While $500 is substantially less expensive than $5,000, for people who live in developing countries, the cost is still staggering. Additionally, many developing countries do not have reliable access to the internet or the infrastructure to ensure that electricity will be available to recharge electronic refreshable braille devices. And many developing countries, it is unlikely that they will have repair facilities to maintain these high-tech devices. Next slide, please. For the Marrakesh Treaty to realize its potential, more countries must participate in sharing accessible works. Recently, Canada shared a few hundred accessible books with Australia. But the real impact will result from thousands of books, not hundreds, but thousands of books being exchanged. As more countries ratify, ratify the Marrakesh Treaty, more and more books will be available for distribution. The real impact will come when the countries that create large numbers of accessible works ratify the Marrakesh Treaty, and that means the EU and the US. The EU will deposit its ratification with WIPO later this year, and we hope the US will soon follow suit. So in conclusion, I urge all of you, please seek ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty in your country. It will open the door to education and employment for blind people throughout the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Schroeder. Christopher Lee, please. Chris? Good morning. Um, I'm representing G3ICT and IAAP. And IAAP stands for the International Association for Accessible Professionals. And I was wondering if I could get the slide quicker. Um, IAAP has been around since um, 2014, um, and it is a membership organization. Um, the important thing to know about IAAP um, is that it was founded by 31 members, and these members included um, individuals, disability organizations, nonprofit organizations, educational organizations, accessible consulting organizations, and the private sector. So um, in 2014, it was kind of a brainchild of a couple folks to come together, and they did, and they promoted it, and it was a kind of an inclusive look at including everyone to get the membership up going. Um, it is um, the primary reason why it was started and was to promote worldwide factors of driving the needs of accessibility experts. So that was one of the primary reasons why. And it was four objectives within that, which I'm going to read. Um, increasing compliance requirements was number one. Ratifying of the UNCRPD was number two. Dealing with the aging demographics was number three. And number four was industry competition to provide superior digital expertise. So those were the four reasons why we have the IWP today. In 2016 of July, the IWP actually merged with um, G3ICT. So it became a part of G3ICT, uh, which is a perfect home for it. And it's been there ever since, obviously. Um, to give you a little bit of, of what we do as, as a membership organization, um, we provide professional certifications. We do professional development. We have an area of networking within the accessibility community. And we have a organizational change of best practices. So um, those are the four areas that IWP works in. And to drill down a little bit more on that, to tell you a little bit more about our members, since 2014, we currently have 1,364 members. 
Um, that breaks down to organizational members, such as 76 organizational members in 36, 39 countries represented. We do have chapters. We have the Nordic chapter. Susanna is involved in that, obviously, the UK and the India chapters currently right now. And we are working towards expanding those chapters to other countries. Um, the four top industry sectors include IT, information technology, education, specifically higher education has grown, um, the financial service industry, healthcare has also been involved in that, um, and government. Those are the four sectors that we've been seeing coming as members. So the, the goal, as I somewhat mentioned, but the goal of the certifications um, is to strengthen the community of practice among accessibility professionals. So that's the primary goal that we're looking at. Um, there are some objectives underneath that, and that is obviously to define what accessibility professionals are. And to talk a little bit about that, um, to give you a process, there, there are several levels that we are doing that in. Um, it's not a, actually an easy task. Um, we have to pull in subject matter experts globally um, to look at defining the body of knowledge regarding these certifications. Um, secondly, we've got to write questions tied to those certifications, and we have a committee that does that separately. And then in addition to that, we have to review those questions. So it's three-pronged in a sense. And after that process, it kind of drills down to working with our professional testing organization, which is separate, that helps make sure that we are in compliance with those questions globally. Um, we provide these exams virtually as well as we provide them um, in, in the sense of um, um, on-site. So we have to work with a professional testing center to do that globally. And that has caused some challenges um, in the sense of making sure that those, um, those places, those environments are fully accessible. So that is something that we have worked with as well as making sure that our online testing um, applications are accessible too. Um, we also increase, um, the, another objective is to increase the quality of work, um, provide um, confidential of uh, competence and commitment to the accessibility field, deliver employees with a metric of measurement, that's a goal of ours, and offer colleagues, uh, colleges and universities and vocational programs with curriculum outline for teaching accessibility. And we've been trying to collaborate and work with the Teach Access program, which is mostly U.S. based but we're trying to drill down in that and make that a, a, another objective that we, we follow through with. Um, we are um, committed to making sure that we are following um, the Institute for Credentialing Excellence, um, also the National Commission on Certification of Agencies, and the American National Standard Institute um, that are backing up. So we are definitely members of those two. Um, now to um, talk a little bit about the certification programs. Currently, we have um, the CPAC, which is the Certified Professional for Accessibility Core Competency. And we also have the Web Accessibility Specialist. Combined, that makes up the Certified Professional in Web Accessibility CPWA. So if that makes sense, if you, if you take the, the CPAC, and then take the web accessibility one, you become a certified professional in web accessibility. So you combine that. Um, those are currently what we have offering right now. Now, in regards to the CPAC numbers, um, we're looking at um, 356 um, individuals that have passed the CPAC. Um, regarding the WAS, or the, the web accessibility specialist, we have 63. That was just launched um, um, last year. And regarding the CPWA, we have 45. Regarding the pass-fail rate, we're looking at um, passing about 86% for the CPACC. And the WAS, we don't have the numbers there quite for that. But we are tracking that, obviously. In the future, um, we are planning to move forward. And um, we are actually right now working on pulling together the, the subject matter experts for the procurement specialist that we are hopeful to launch, and I say hopeful, to launch um, this summer. 
Um, and um, that will be hopefully the first testing phase of that will be the, in August. Um, after that, in, in 2019, we're going to be um, looking at a document content specialist certification and then moving on to mobile accessibility. Um, in addition to those, it has been talked about um, that we might be looking at an aging related um, ICT certificate um, as well as possibly a higher education. So those are other ones that we're considering. Um, we do have a global leadership council that helps drive that decision. Just to give you a little bit um, of, of feedback on what we're hearing from the participants that are going through the exams. Oh, I'm sorry. One minute? OK. I didn't hear the sound. <laughs> so this gives you a little bit of that. So overall, we've been getting great um, rates overall of this, the, the different certifications that we have. I do want to mention that um, there are several resources in regarding this membership organization. We have a job board. We have live webinars as well as archive webinars, a newsletter. Um, we have a community of practice called Connections. That's a social media aspect that is a thread of different issues that may come up that you can post to. There's about 1,300 members, as I mentioned, so it's somewhat can be active and depending on what uh, is being posted. And um, I will. I will end up just real quickly with the higher education community of practice. Um, in fact, tomorrow in M6 at 8 o'clock, we're going to have a very informal um, session about um, starting off and launching a um, community of practice for higher education. So I hope you can join us. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hush, please. You're on. Let me. You can, you can speak here or on the podium if you wish. I can, I can go to the podium, no problem. Okay. Let me. Let me. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that, that this is the right presentation. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the presentation. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Bhattacharji. I am a visually impaired person. Has been working with the Access to Information Program, Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh. And, uh, same time, I'm the second vice president of uh, Global Alliance of Accessible Technology and Environment Gauge, and uh, work with uh, a local NGO is called Young Power in Social Action, IPSA. Mm, friends, this is the third time for me to come here in Jiro Project Conference uh, 2018. Last two times, uh, my innovation was awarded, so thanks to the Jiro Project Conference. Um, you know, today I'm just talking about a um, in the second slide, I'm talking about the uh, access to information program under Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh. This is a special program designed for making digital Bangladesh, and now we are considering to make this digital Bangladesh inclusive and barrier-free for all. Um, access to information program's main objective to bring the uh, service to the citizen doorsteps, so citizen cannot ignore the citizen with disabilities. Um, they have recruited me as a national consultant accessibility. Friends think in a country like Bangladesh, a blind person has been working with the highest level of the office, that is prime minister office, and influence them to make their e-service and ICTs accessible for all. Uh, slide uh, G. Um, you know, multimedia talking book. It is a DAISY a standard multimedia talking book. With the support of Access to Information Program A2I, Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh, a local NGO, Young Power in Social Action, IPSA, has developed DAISY a standard full text, full audio multimedia talking book. From grade 1 to grade 10, all the textbooks now available in um, accessible format, including Braille. Each year, 
um, Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh has hand over um, books to the student. Last three years, visual impaired student also getting accessible books along with other students. Friends, this is a true innovation. We make a books which is accessible for all. There is a audio and text are inbuilt. And same time, we have a EPUB 3 accessible ebook. So anyone can read and access the books. And we have a digital braille that is easily um, can convert it into braille printed version. And these multimedia talking books already win number of international awards, including G Giro Projects Awards 2016, uh, um, WSIS Award 2017. I can give you one personal experience why we developed this multimedia talking book. My daughter, when she was in a class one, that means grade one, always she came to me and asked me, Papa, please read the books for me. Always I told her, oh, I can't. You just go to, to your mother. She again and again come to me and asked me to read a book. She didn't know that her father is a blind. He cannot read a printed books. In that time, I thought if I could innovate anything which is accessible for my child, accessible for a blind child, accessible for a blind parents, then that would be a wonderful innovation. And I apply for a service innovation fund run by Access to Information Program A2I, and I win it and make a multimedia talking books. These books, my daughter can see, I can listen. That means it is accessible for all. Friends, this is the true innovation we are talking about. To bring this book to the city citizen, for to bring these books to the citizen, Bangladesh government has developed a low-cost DAISY player supported android supported daisy player it is only 50 dollar price and governments are distributing free uh, low cost daisy player to the blind children so uh, now we have a multimedia talking books and same time daisy player i can remember the father of the daisy mr hiroshi kawamura was visiting bangladesh and i told him i think 20 years ago kawamura son i have a dream that all children can read one day in Bangladesh. He told me, your dream, that is our dream. Let's work for that. Today I can say, my students, they are getting accessible books. Believe me, when I was a student, I never ever got a single book in accessible format. Now we have books. Um, we are listening about the Maracas Treaty ratification. Bangladesh has taken initiative to ratify the Maracas Treaty. Access to Information Program A2I again lead the process. Friends, we already drafted the copyright law, and there is a copyright exception for the persons with visual disability. And we already facilitating the notes to the um, cabinet division to ratification of the Maracas Treaty. I am requesting World Blind Union and WIPO, please come forward to work with our government to support them to ratify the Maracas Treaty. There is a political commitment to ratification of the Maracas Treaty, but we have some confusion among us. So we need a support from international community to convince our policymaker that Maracas Treaty is helpful for our country. I believe you will come forward to me and support our country, our government, to ratification of the Maracas Treaty. Um, 20 years ago, I think around 22 years ago, when I was trying to enter a, in, in a university, that was University of Chittagong in my home city. They are not allowed me to admit in the university. Me and my friends started hunger strike in that time, and they allowed me, us to study. Today, that university has taken to make a model of inclusive university in Bangladesh. 100 plus persons with disabilities are now studying in University of Chittagong. We are making accessible books for them, that is multimedia talking books. We are making library systems for the students. They have a quota for the students. They have a scholarship and any other facilities for the students, including infrastructural development. Bangladesh government, again, 
Access to Information Program A2I has launched a challenge fund to facilitate the inclusive university. That means we have identified some challenges for facilitating inclusive university and there is a 30,000 uh, US dollar price money to solve a problem. We have identified the problem and we ask the citizen to come up with a solution and we are awarding 30,000 US dollar for any solutions and governments are replicating that solution. So now we believe uh, Bangladesh first inclusive university will be uh, in place by 2018 and anyone can um, re study, any student with disabilities can study in that university and that will be replicated to our, throughout the country. Um, this year, another innovation. We applied for the Zero Project Awards, but we failed. Um, that is a, another innovation and design of inclusive, a model of inclusive design. We have developed an accessible dictionary. That is Bengali to English, English to Bengali, Bengali to Bengali, English to English, which is accessible for all, including any student, visual impaired, other types of disabilities, and other students. You can visit www dot accessible dictionary dot gov dot vd. This is one of my innovation which has awarded by the access to information program A2I, Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh and Honorable Prime Minister has launched this dictionary on 1st um, February in the um, um, you know in the book fair of Bangla Academy, which is, you know, the, we, we are celebrating um, International Mother Language Day. So in the uh, book fair, Honorable Prime Minister has launched the dictionary. I think there is some picture. You can see that Prime Minister are uh, inaugurating the dictionary. Anyone can use this dictionary. This, we have an Android version. We have an Android version. We have an um, online version and also desktop version. Without internet, people can use the dictionary. Um, Bangladesh have a largest uh, web portal in the world. We have 25,000 websites. We are asking collaboration from the international uh, community, such as W3C. Please come forward to support us to make our website accessible. Uh, we are going to make a national web accessibility policy, which is already drafted. We need collaboration. We are really seeking your collaboration. Please support our government to make a national standard for the web accessibility. Uh, we got uh, a number of awards and recognition, like WSAS Award, International Excellence Award on Accessible Publishing, uh, Zero Projects Awards, et cetera, et cetera. I think my time finished. Um, I should not say more. Only I'd like to say um, our vision, no one leave behind, and we will achieve SDZ by 2030 through including um, ensure accessible and equitable education for students with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Jiro Project Conference, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice stuff. Hopefully, I'll get a picture of that. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, now, can uh, uh, Tiran, please, you, you are the, the podium? The, the clicker is on the podium. Yes. Right, the clicker has disappeared, but the slides have appeared, so I suppose <laughs> that is some small progress to begin with. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Tiernan. I'm from Wayfinder. I will start by apologizing to the people who also heard me speak yesterday, but today's topic is slightly different, so hopefully I'll be able to <laughs> keep your attention. Um, I'm going to speak today a bit about um, Wayfinder's approach of using user-centered technologies to try to make, or user-centered standards to try to make emerging technologies accessible to as many people as possible, kind of from the outset. So just to start with a little bit about Wayfinder as an organization, Wayfinder is a non-profit partnership between the Royal Society for Blind Children, which is a charity working with vision impaired children and young people um, in London and increasingly across the United Kingdom, and a design studio called Us Two, who make mobile applications and games and things like that. Wayfinder was established in 2015 in response to a kind of 
a challenge posed by many of the young people who are working with RSBC. They wanted to be able to find a way to travel independently on the London Underground, the metro system in the UK, using just everyday technology they already had and were familiar with, which is effectively the smartphones that everyone carries around in their pocket these days. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, now a bigger idea than that and to make it possible for people who are vision impaired to travel independently or spontaneously wherever and whenever they want to anywhere in the world. We know from our experience in the UK that half of vision impaired people don't leave their homes as often as they would like to and 79% of them face serious difficulties when they're trying to use public transport. Um, we also know that if you can allow people to use public transport independently whenever they want to, you make it possible for them to do a huge um, lot more, such as being, making sure they can get to work on time reliably and go out to meet their friends, um, which can help overcome a lot of the challenges vision impaired people face in society. So we're aware that um, indoor navigation and particularly indoor audio navigation um, had the possibility to make it much easier for people who are vision impaired to use public transport. So uh, we started working on that and like many of the people I think you can see on the accessibility trail outside or speak to or some of whom you may have seen speaking yesterday, um, we started off developing a, a prototype mobile application. We approached Transport for London who facilitated a test of it at the London Underground Station. Um, this established a proof of concept for us that an audio navigation system could help vision impaired people move through a complex space like a train station independently and um, also the user feedback we got from the RSBC beneficiaries who tested it was really, really amazing. And it was at this stage our approach changed slightly, so we could have taken that prototype app and tried to develop it into kind of a full solution and push to get it adopted in London, but we thought we could do something that had a much more global impact. Um, by creating an accessibility standard, it would be possible that audio navigation systems and indoor navigation systems all over the world could be made accessible for vision impaired people from the beginning. So to do that, we came up with the Wayfinder Open Standard. Um, this is important because you may know that indoor navigation is this kind of massively growing market. It's, it's kind of exploding. It's supposed to grow by about 52% a year between now and 2022. Uh, that's to do with indoor positioning technologies and then the kind of the navigation and location elements that come on top of that. Some of you may have already seen in your Google Maps and your Apple Maps increasingly if you're going through an airport there's kind of a rudimentary indoor map or in some cases in a shopping centre. I think there's a shopping centre that's like two metro stops away from here that has an indoor map now as well. That's available on Google Maps. So by 2022 these services are going to be pretty much mainstream and um, a quarter of the times people use a navigation app it will be for an indoor journey. So what we're trying to do is make this um, emerging service accessible to vision impaired people from the beginning, trying to avoid some of the other situations we've seen where you've had consumer technologies emerge, come to market, and um, grow to maturity, and only then do people start looking at accessibility features. I think as some of the other panelists pointed out, um, it's not an ideal solution from an inclusion perspective, and it's also a lot more expensive to start retrofitting accessibility to, to buildings and services and things like that. So in terms of what, what's actually contained in the open standard, it focuses very much on the user experience of a person who's using an audio navigation system to guide them through an indoor environment. Um, it's absolutely free to use, it's up on our website and it's basically a set of design guidelines. So the idea is an application developer or a building owner can pick this up and will give them all the information they need to start looking at how they can develop and roll out an indoor audio navigation system on their premises. The fundamental aim of what the standard tries to do is give that really consistent user experience to the user so that for someone who's vision impaired they know exactly what type of information an audio navigation is system is going to give them and when. Um, this means they'll be able to plan how they can use it along with, say, their primary mobility aid, like a long cane or a guide dog if they use one, and also give them the confidence to use any indoor navigation application in any location, whether it's a train station they use twice a day going to and from work, or if they want to travel to a different country and use an indoor navigation system somewhere they've never been before. Um, it's an open standard, so it's developed um, on the principles of consensus as well as user-centered design. So we had an awful lot of input from academics and experts, an awful lot of vision impairment charities in the UK and beyond, and then a lot of um, navigation application developers as well. So um, as we kind of progress towards the conclusion of developing this open standard, we're looking at the best way to have it adopted as widely as possible, and um, that's when we 
started working with the International Telecommunications Union. So as you know, the ITU is um, one of the oldest, not the oldest standardization organizations in the world, um, and a kind of a branch of the United Nations. We approached them with the work we've done so, we've done so far. They um, took it up as a work item, refined the standard through their working group, and in March 2017, they adopted an IT recommendation on accessible indoor audio navigation systems. So this is the, the world's first accessibility standard for audio navigation. And I suppose slightly unusually, it's come before you have a mass market in indoor navigation services. So this means the work we've done is recognized in 193 or 194 countries around the world. Um, so I th we think that really gives us a unique opportunity to have kind of quite a transformational impact for an offline division impaired people in a very short time frame, probably within the next five or so years. Um, we very much come at it from the perspective of people with vision impairment, but we've also have l had a lot of interest in audio navigation from groups who represent people suffering from cognitive impairments such as dementia, or people who have print disabilities. And there are some interesting use cases that tumble out of that that aren't necessarily to do with accessibility. So for example, in London, there would be 19 million tourists a year not all of them are able to read English language signage, and in some parts of the London Metro network, the signage is just terrible, speaking as someone who still gets lost there quite frequently. So um, audio navigation there is interesting in terms of accessibility, but also allowing um, transport infrastructure to be used more efficiently. And most importantly now, it means these systems can be accessible from the bidding and there are further benefits of an inclusive design approach for people of access needs or people who don't consider themselves to have access needs. Um, in terms of the, the challenges and success factors, the, the interesting thing about Wayfinder is we're obviously trying to de um, deliver for vision impaired end users at scale. But the way we do that is by working with businesses, not directly with the vision impaired users. So that's why we've created the Wayfinder community. So this is a group of organizations who are interested in the development and adoption of audio navigation. And in there, there are an awful lot of these application developers and providers. And our hope is by bringing them all together in one place, um, we can share experience, share our learnings, um, continue updating the open standards. So it really provides that top-notch, consistent user experience for people at the end of the day. I'm aware I'm running slightly short on time. So luckily, I am coming to the end in any case. Um, in terms of the next steps for Wayfinder as an organization, we're continuing our work with the International Telecommunications Union um, on further refinements of the standard and also some documents that will make it easier for organizations to see um, how well they comply with the standard or otherwise. And um, also in terms of the training capacity building side, we're working on courses for accessibility professionals about audio navigation in general and particularly the use of the standard so that um, they can start building it into accessibility uh, strategies they use with built environment owners and services like that. So that's all I have to say. So thanks very much for your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Victor has just joined us and uh, he was first on my speakers list. I'd like to give him the floor. Victor is the World Enabled and Co-Chair of G3ICT, World Enabled Smart Cities for All. Uh, Victor and I are very old friends. He's much younger than I am. <laughs> but he, uh, we, began, uh, we began in the negotiations in 2002 of the CRPD, and I can testify that he is one of the world leaders and one of our heroes in the disability community. So Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador distinguished guests, colleagues. I feel that there's a very pressing opportunity now for us to focus in on the future uh, of our cities. And um, this is why my lecture, my contribution today, will really focus on an initiative that will help expand the work of accessibility to the way cities provide their public services. Uh, my background is not only as a uh, uh, human rights and development expert, but also as an urban planner. So my professional background is in urban planning. I have a PhD in urban planning and I teach urban planning at the University of California at Berkeley. So the issue of urbanization, the issue of, trans of changing demographics, the issues of the ways that we build cities is of primary importance to me. 
the presentation today is really an initiative, a joint initiative between an organization that I run called World Enabled, as well as uh, an organization that the ambassador chairs, which is the G3 ICT, which is where we are today at this forum. We came together to really look at the convergence between technology and urban planning and urban development. Can we next slide? Oh, do I have the clicker? So this is my colleague, James. James Thirst is the vice president of G3ICT. And we basically are two guys on a global mission to make smart cities accessible to all. And this effort really has taken us to engage in deep discussions with city leaders and the mayors of uh, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, London, Barcelona, uh, and also a very good discussion we had two weeks ago um, in Kuala Lumpur during the World Urban Forum. Next slide. So smart cities, really smart cities um, are using information communication technologies to enhance livability, workability, and sustainability. But there's a big push in transferring the conversation around smart cities from a conversation of technology towards a conversation of innovation and inclusion. How can this technology infrastructure, nearly $2 trillion of investments by cities in upgrading technology infrastructures, how can this massive opportunity uh, lead to better outcomes for persons with disabilities as well as older persons. Next slide. So really we know that there are one billion people that might have difficulty moving around, seeing, difficulty with self-care, difficulty with hearing. We're not talking about a medical diagnosis. We're talking about functional diversity in the population that only increases with age. So how do we look at the systems within cities, whether it's transportation infrastructure or social services, and look at how innovations in the delivery of these public services through technology can either include or might exclude persons with disabilities and older persons. Next slide. Next slide. So the percentage of people living in cities will grow from 50% to 70%. What that means is that just in China alone, the rate of urbanization is requiring China to build a city of one million people every week. So every week in China, there is such a massive urban shift that a city of a million people has to be built, right? On a global level, there's a massive uh, concentration of people coming to cities, uh, and yet cities are stretched with their budgets, and they're looking for innovative solutions. Next slide. So the number of smart cities that are really deploying technology across every aspect of public service is increasing rapidly. Next slide. And the question becomes, are smart cities designing for everyone? Are smart cities designing for persons with disabilities? Um, so James Thurston and I launched this initiative almost two years ago, and we launched it with the Global Survey. Next slide. The Global Survey uh, con uh, reached over 200 global smart city experts, and uh, the majority basically told us that smart cities are failing persons with disabilities. And only 18% could actually name a smart city that was using ICT accessibility standards. Next slide. So we decided to do something about that. And we looked at three international agreements. Article 9 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that I had the great honor to, to work with Ambassador Gallegos and others on developing clearly states that access to technology is a human right. The Sustainable Development Goals 
have a, a goal number 11, focusing on inclusive and resilient cities. And then the New Urban Agenda, another global instrument that I engaged actively through the global network on disability inclusive uh, and accessible urban development, we were able to get 15 references to people with disabilities in this global agreement on cities. So now cities have a very clear mandate to put accessibility at the, as a core principle in all the work that they do, including technology investments. Next slide. So to do that work, uh, we, we engaged with interviews, discussions, focus groups, and brought all this knowledge and data together to create a toolkit, Smart Cities for All toolkit, that has five components. The first is responding to what we saw, that cities did not know what the ICT accessibility standards were. So one of the tools is a guide to priority standards, how cities can understand the digital disability standards and how to adopt them. The second tool is a guide to adopting a model procurement policy. So if the city is going to contract the development of a website or a kiosk or an application to help uh, people use the Transport for London, uh, for example, uh, transportation system, uh, what would be the kind of uh, specific requirements in procurement that will ensure that those services are done in a way that do not leave people with disabilities behind. The third was the biggest barrier was not budgets for smart cities to be accessible, but awareness. So we created a communication tool that provides the cases and the arguments for promoting digital inclusion. The fourth was a database of solutions with best practices. And the last was a model mature, a maturity model as a benchmarking tool. This tool is available in 10 languages. I encourage you all to write down the website and download the toolkit. It can be found at smart cities number four all dot org. Next slide. So the, the maturity model will be launched soon. It's a benchmarking tool. Next slide. And it'll help you understand the ability of your city to to be more inclusive. Next slide. Uh, we want to continue this work by providing technical assistance directly to smart cities, expand the tools available, continue to promote ICT accessibility on a global scale as we've been doing at the World Urban Forum. Next slide. Increase the capacity of cities to, to uh, respond to these issues and really change the dialogue. This is not only about uh, accessibility, this is about innovation and being able to create a city that responds to everyone and mobilizing the best practices to do so. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Victor. Uh, it is 11 o'clock, and um, uh, I understand that uh, we've all been since very early in the morning, especially the ones who gave keynote speeches. So we will have a short break. I understand 15, 20 minutes, 20 minute break. So ladies and gentlemen, please have your coffees and come back and we will have the last speakers on our panel and questions and answers from the, uh, from the public. Thank you. We will, uh, we will begin our second phase uh, with Susana Laurin, CEO of Funca NUAB on the critical importance of accessibility policy, public procurement, and program implementation. Uh, yes. Muy bien. So, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So we lost half of the audience, mm. but I will speak to you. Um, so I think I can see the time and I do see the traffic lights, so let's start this. Um, just a short um, presentation of who we are. We are a small consultancy based in, in Sweden. We have the headquarters in Sweden. So we have also other companies, all other offices. I'll walk us through quickly. We were started by the 
joint uh, disability organizations in Sweden, and, um, and then we became a private company in the year 2000. We opened an office in Oslo outside of the EU um, in 2010, because they have a very interesting legislation and they also have a lot of oil money, so it's always interesting to work in Norway. Um, and then we also have uh, an office in the south of, of Europe, in Madrid, where the sun is shining uh, stronger and, and nicer, and also the, and the wine is better and everything. So that's really our, <laughs> our um, the Brussels office, but we choose to have it in Spain. That's yeah, it's a good strategic decision, I think. We're also one of the proud founders of the International Association of the Accessibility Professionals, and we just started the Nordic chapter, as Chris, Chris mentioned earlier, so we are very happy about that. Uh, what we do in our daytime, that is consulting, just uh, we are consulting as everyone else is consulting, I guess. We do development so we can uh, build and design uh, websites and systems and apps. Uh, what we are most known for is our user testing, the analysis, the way we hold hand with, with our clients to make them uh, succeed in, in accessibility, of course. And we do a lot of training because until now I haven't seen anyone building or producing something inaccessible because they want to exclude people, it's because of lack of knowledge, obviously. So training is a big part of what we do. So that's the, the consultancy part. But what maybe uh, makes us a little bit different than the other consultancies is that 20% of our turnover is research and innovation. So we do uh, work with many of the uh, leading universities and we also have a scientific methodology when we do and the um, accessibility training and audits and, and that kind of thing. We think that is extremely important that we don't only uh, recommend things based on guesses, but we really, uh, everything that we recommend should be tested in real life with, with real humans. Um, we have a lot of government assignments. We work for the commission, several locations, and also we have a network of, I think now, nine or ten European national governments. We are uh, helping in different ways with the implementation of the Web Accessibility Directive. Um, and we collaborate closely with end-user organizations in, in all our markets, obviously. They are sort of our parents and also one of the most important ways of us to learn what is really important for the humans, because that's really what is making us move forward. Uh, and we do a lot of work in standardization as well. That's one of the key issues for, for succeeding in accessibility, the way we look at it. So uh, we are doing standardization on national and European level as well. So that's us. Um, I usually say, especially when I'm talking in the US or Canada, that in Europe the carrot sometimes spits the stick and people look at me and think I'm crazy. But that has been the case, uh, not least in the Nordic part of the northern part of Europe. We have been living without legislation for many years and still we have been doing quite well um, in the ICT arena uh, when it comes to accessibility for different reasons. Uh, we have done some research on this um, for the Commission and also in other projects and assignments during, during the, the years and we have found that there are four pillars Oh, this looks strange, but okay. Um, uh, you need, um, there are four pillars that makes uh, countries successful in our, the way we look at web accessibility uh, success at least. Uh, so well implemented policies, of course, and I think that is what G3ICT is pushing uh, also worldwide. So we agree that is extremely uh, important. And, and sometimes we find that the, legis the regulations shouldn't be too precise. That might sound strange, but, but really we have found in countries where, where you have a very specific technical re uh, requirement or such, they risk to be outdated very quickly or they also sometimes uh, risk to uh, hinder or set a barrier for innovation. So the, the, the regulations need to be cleverly laid out. Of course, you also need active end-use organizations and end-use organizations with resources enough to be able to push for accessibility and not least the industry, the solution makers, so to speak, the suppliers, they also need to know what they're talking about. Uh, but we have found so far that you cannot really uh, only work with the solution maker, you need to sort of create demand first because then you move the industry with you, uh, otherwise they won't do anything. Um, so, and in that respect, we find the procurement directive really one of the most important things that has happened uh, in the latest years. From the 1st of January 2017, uh, the EU has a new directive on procurement with stronger uh, or increased level of, of requirements for accessibility. Um, that is based on the EN301549, the same standard as that also the Web Accessibility Directive is pointing to. Um, and this, uh, this standard is really uh, absolutely not perfect. Standards are rarely a perfect thing, but it's a European standard that covers not only uh, web, but the whole ICT um, 
topic, so to speak, and it's really the broadest uh, and the best standard we have so far. Uh, and it's uh, really the basis of the European legislation. So this standard, even if it's, of course, as always, hard to understand and, and difficult and complex and everything, it is a good support for, for procurers. And there are tools uh, provided and, and uh, instruction videos and, and all sorts of things to make it easier to, to understand how to use this standard. And we do see already that the procurers are increasingly uh, using it. We see a, a large um, increase in, in better procurements uh, with requirements, specific requirements for accessibility. Um, it also makes the opportunities for the suppliers more equal, more fair, so that, that the best supplier can win, not based on how they answer to the accessibility requirements. So I think also for the suppliers, this, this standard and this regulation is really important. Um, we see that knowledge is spreading. It's spreading unevenly throughout Europe, and, and I would, of course, hope that it was spread uh, even faster. Um, but we do see that it's, it is spreading, and I just uh, told my uh, uh, co-speaker here in the panel in the break that we have seen uh, an enormous increase in our company that before we had almost no ICT uh, companies as our clients because they didn't know why they would need accessibility support. But now, because of the demand side, because of the procurers actually uh, pointing to accessibility standards, the ICT companies are coming to us. So from our client base being like 1 or 2 percent ICT companies is now up to 25 percent ICT companies. So that means something. The procurement is really working. Uh, and that is in the EU countries, of course. Um, that is, we already see the trend. Yeah. Um, so to me, I really think, not only because I've been so involved in this standard that took ages to create, but I really believe that procurement can make a difference. The whole point is that if you get the, the procurers to understand this, if you spread the knowledge so that they know that this is really something they need to do, um, then the, uh, the suppliers that want to, buy, to sell to private, to, oh, sorry, the suppliers really want to sell to public sector because at least in the high taxed world uh, where I come from, uh, the money never ends in the <laughs> public sector. So all the suppliers want to sell to public sector. And when they do that, the suppliers can, of course, uh, they need to, um, to uh, comply with the regulations and then they could potentially have two different versions of their system or whatever it is, one accessible for the public and one unaccessible for the private. But I don't think they will do that. Maybe that will be the case in the beginning, but if they are clever, they don't want to keep two separate things uh, alive in the same time. So in a while, we will spread this also to private sector. So there, that's why I really think that procurement can make a big difference. And the traffic light says red, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lon. Hi, um, so my name is Shadi Abuzara. I work for the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. We've heard today a lot about web accessibility, um, and so um, in this session, I want to give you a little bit more details about what web accessibility is and how we can work together to move that forward. So um, to make the web accessible, and web itself, I'll, I'll come back to that later, what is the web. But to make the web accessible, there are really several components, several pieces that need to work together. W3C is an international vendor neutral consortium that develops the core standards for the web. Things like HTML, XML, CSS, and so on, which web developers use to create websites and web content in general. It was founded by the inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee, and is now um, uh, um, an organization that is, as I said, creating those technical specifications. So when you're creating a website, you are using so-called authoring tools. Most of the content that is created is by non-technical uh, people using content management systems using Facebook, using Twitter, using social media, all these things are actually ways to create content. So we're all generating content. We're all creating content. At the same time, users use browsers and media players, sometimes also assistive technologies to access the content and interact with it. All these pieces need to work together to provide accessibility. So W3C 
has three sets of standards that are internationally recognized uh, as the standard for, for, for web accessibility, basically. Most well known is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, which defines what is accessible content. And content is a very broad term. This includes the text that you have on the web. It includes images, videos, audio, um, forms. Everything that you have on the website needs to be accessible uh, for people with different kinds of disabilities. But also the authoring tools that are used to create websites, that are used to create the content, they need to generate accessible content. This is the only way that we can achieve those standards that we refer to, um, the policies, and maintain that level of accessibility. If I create a website today, tomorrow it's completely different because somebody uploaded more content. They changed the document, they changed the contents. But at the same time, these authoring tools themselves need to be accessible. Because people with disabilities are also content creators, are also part of the community. And last but not least, browsers and media players need to be accessible. Very simple example, if I have a media player that does not show the captions of videos, then there's no point of creating the captions in the first place. So this is what we call end-to-end -end accessibility, from the creation of the content, the making it available on the websites, and also rendering and interacting with it. To illustrate that, a very simple example of a very well-known requirement, which is to make um, images to provide text alternatives for images. So to describe images that are on a website. In this case, we have the logo of the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. So as the developer, the content author is creating, is uploading that image, ideally the content management system will ask, will prompt the user, um, the, the, the author, what is this image uh, providing? What information is this image providing? And a very simple text alternative is Web Accessibility Initiative logo. This is just the logo of the Web Accessibility Initiative. Now this text alternative can then be provided as text, as braille, it can be read aloud as audio, so it can be provided in different formats for different people with different kinds of disabilities. This is just one example of how accessibility works. But there are many such requirements in the web content accessibility guidelines that address the broad spectrum of people with disabilities and the cross-disability requirements. For instance, somebody who needs to use the keyboard because they are blind and don't use a mouse is very similar to somebody who has a physical disability and also cannot use a mouse. So really, the web content, accessibility, uh, web content accessibility guidelines has been internationally recognized by many regional standards and policies. So US Section 508 is a very good example here. This is a technical standard. At the same time, it's a law. It's a policy for procurement. We just heard about the impact of procurement and the importance. And it's really made a big difference, a big change in the US. In Europe, we also heard about this EN301549. It's a technical standard to encompass all ICT, and part of that is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I also want to mention that WCAG is being used also outside the context of web. So it's been applied because it's technology agnostic also to web and non-web, um, sorry, non-web software and non-web documents. And most recently, W3C and IDPF, the International Digital Publishing Forum, merged. And so uh, the EPUB accessibility uh, 1.0 is also based on these web content accessibility guidelines. And this brings me to an important point, what I mentioned very much earlier. What is the web? We're seeing a lot of convergence of technologies. Uh, earlier. Today, uh, Ambassador Gallegos, you, you, you mentioned uh, the um, TV, mobile. 
the first set of requirements that you mentioned there, well, they're all converging. Where does the web start and TV end, or TV and mobile? They're all converging together. And so addressing these together is incredibly important. And this is where we see the web as the universal platform also to the internet of things, as all these devices are being connected. We heard the presentation about Wayfinder. Um, all these technologies, all these um, distributed and connected um, objects, basically, uh, converging onto the internet, the web can be a universal platform here to allow access, uh, seamless access across these different technologies and provide a, a, a user interface uh, that provides the accessibility requirements. So maybe also a comment to Bangladesh when you are uh, creating the web accessibility guidelines it's really important to make sure that these are harmonized with the internationally available standards. Um, because disabilities don't change across borders. In Europe, a lot of effort has been spent on harmonizing the different standards in the different member states. And we're very happy now that the Commission has this universal standard. Um, there was also lots of work between the US and Europe. And last year, the Zero Project, uh, this was recognized this harmonized standard, and we need to work together globally on that. So this brings me just to the closing points. We need to work together on the evolution of technologies, on those technologies converging onto the web. We need to work together on policies and standardization in ensuring harmonized standards and policies moving forward. And W3C provides this open space and welcomes collaboration with uh, all, mem uh, all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi. Jake Adma, please. The magic stick. Thank you, Sadi. So, when designers and developers are new to accessibility, it's easy for them to also get overwhelmed by all of the standards, the laws, and the regulations. So instead of having them get mired in all the checklists and all the language behind them, why not just start by showing them what accessibility means and how it works and what their role and responsibility is. So after the awareness, the questions uh, become like, where can we start? Or how does it work to implement accessibility into your processes. Well, for this, we are developing a three-way approach, in, and I would like to tell you something about that. But first, a little bit about organization. I work for an organization which is centralized and decentralized at the same time. And within this company, um, a couple of years ago, I started to build a user interface framework. And a user interface framework is a set of reusable components. It's like the building blocks of a website where there always is attention on one side to deliver a lot of quantity and on the other side you want to spend a little bit more time on the quality of the product. And of course that's really good for accessibility. So there are a lot of forces at play and you need to balance those forces. And we soon realized that from within the team itself, it's really difficult to make that choice of should we deliver the product or should we spend some more time on the quality. So it was time for a specialized team and we set up an accessibility task force just to try to see uh, what we could do with a specialized team. And the specialized team, of course, is accommodating the forces in the way of working. So on the other side, the organization was reorganizing. We used to have a waterfall organization with a waterfall approach, and we were transforming in an organization who is using the agile approach and the scrum methodologies. So um, within this process of reorganizing, we were, uh, we were divided in really big chunks, which are called, in our case, tribes and squads, which are multidisciplinary teams, and chapters. 
And to give you an, an idea about what a squad means, is that there are people with different disciplines within the squad. So there's a developer, a customer journey expert, uh, a designer and a product owner in the same team. With these two facts in place, we had to plan for accessibility. And to give you an idea, we, the IAG Bank is like a really large organization. We have a couple of hundred teams around. And uh, we also have a flat organization. That means we prefer the bottom-up approach over a top-down approach. Another interesting fact of our organization and about squads and, and tribes is that all teams make their own decisions. So they are totally autonomous and self-sufficient. And for this, our idea was we should have a three-way approach where we create a baseline, where we are trying to achieve to create a champions network and an, and an expert team, an accessibility team. So planning for accessibility, large organization, autonomous teams, and a three-way approach. And I would like to talk a little bit about the three-way approach itself. First of all, what does the baseline mean? Well, the baseline is just the baseline you should not drop below. In our case, in our baseline, to give you an ID, it's totally digital, and we provide a way to start with accessibility. We call it the getting started, and it's a nine-way approach to get you up and running. Of course, we have and provide general guidelines for everyone, easy to digest, uh, which contains some general guidelines and best practices like the do's and the don'ts. And we provide in a little toolbox where you can find personas, tools, and some really small checklists. To build on top of the baseline, we are on the verge of creating a champions network. And that's really for bridging the gap in the company. We're aiming for one champion in every squad Whereas a champion is a role, so it's not a discipline. And it builds on top of the baseline. Um, what we also have is classroom training, two hours a week for the champions. And we also provide uh, some homework, so they also need to prepare themselves well every week. And we have my accessibility team, which are the experts on accessibility. So we just have the whole company covered. And what I mean with covered is we do the audits, we do the testing. Um, basically, that's just to see where we are now and where do we need to go. We do the co-creation on basis of the audits, on basis of the testing. We can see which team needs a little bit more help, but you can also ask us for help if you have accessibility questions. And we monitor the standards, so the rest of the company doesn't have to do that. In our case, what are the learnings and what are the rewards till now? We have a centralized accessibility portal. What does it mean? The, day, the baseline, which is di digital, is totally covered within the portal. We also have the training section for our champions in the same portal and a good bedside where they can see how to build a drum and also how to build it right. And of course, all the guidelines are covered within the good bedside. And another really important thing for, in this case, the accessibility portal is if you search something, people must find it. So it must be clear and easy. The next one is, so the portal is centralized, but our teams are decentralized. Uh, and that means that also our champions will be decentralized. Who are the champions? They are the customer journey experts, they are the designers, they are the UX persons, they are the developers. And why do, the, why do we specifically aim our focus on, on them? Because they are responsible for the complete development life cycle. So from requirements to design, from design to development, and from development to go live. And this was a very old slide. So this is the previous version 
of uh, my PowerPoint, but I can wrap it up. Um, what we have at this moment is a specialized team. We are the center of set expertise in setting the course. Everything, and that's really important, everything must be really easy to digest for the whole company. So keep it simple, solid, and digital. And we are on the verge of creating a really great champions model. Because in the end, the ambassadors for inclusive products will be the champions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well, ladies and gentlemen. Now comes the, the important heard all the panelists speaking on, on each one of their particular uh, points. Uh, we'd li I'd like to open the floor for questions and answers from, uh, from uh, the audience. If you, you will please raise your hand so I can see them and identify yourself before, uh, before asking the question. And if you, may, if you can, please uh, tell us if you direct this to the panel or to any individual in the panel. So, uh, please, anyone that wants to risk a question? Yes. Uh, please uh, press the microphone so we can hear you, uh, your name, and if you direct the question to anyone in the panel, please. My name is Robin Treisman. I'm from the, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, and my question is actually to Mr. Lee. Um, I was actually going to approach you directly, but perhaps other people want to hear the answer to this question. You talked about the certification. How can people from around the world become certified through you? Is it an online course? We were trying to figure out how to, uh, how to go about that. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's two-pronged. We work with the criteria and testing centers um, across the globe, and they have um, thousands of centers. So you can actually go on into one of those to take the test. You can reserve space, or you could do something online. But how do I learn? <laughs> yeah, so that it's, that's a, <laughs> how do I learn for the test? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a great thing. So the body of knowledge that I mentioned um, during the session really ties to the exam. So those body of knowledges are posted on the the actual site, the IWP site, and then there's p preferred professional providers that we um, vet to ensure that they have, if they have courses that you could actually go through um, to make sure that you're prepared for the exam. Um, DQ is one of those preferred professional providers and you can find those on the site also. And I'll be happy to actually point um, you to other resources too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Question. Thank you. Yes, please. The gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Graham Bippy, I'm a disability consultant, and I think this question is for, for Mr. Schroeder. Um, thinking, uh, reading and listening are two different cognitive skills. I was just wondering if there was any evidence of um, children using Braille having different learning outcomes from those who predominantly use their listening skills, i.e. audiobooks. Thank you. I think that's on. It, it is, the short answer is in terms of documentation, uh, I'm not aware of a study that speaks to this specifically. Most braille readers also use audio. But blind people, this will sound strange to some people, uh, we think of sighted people, some being audio learners, some being visual learners, but that is also the case for blind people. And by that I mean, for some people, le learning through audio presentation is very natural. But for other blind people, they retain information much better if they have it available in a tactile form. Uh, so it's a, it's a spatial connection to the written word in addition to just simply hearing the, the written word. But given that uh, typically blind people are neither fully auditory learners uh, or, or auditory readers, I should say, versus Braille, um, I'm unaware of a study that has actually compared the two. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Uh, I'd like to uh, respond. I don't know who is the speaker. OK. Uh, you know, our country, uh, we are just uh, doing the 
both, like uh, children with disabilities are getting braille books, same braille books, same textbooks are there getting in a multimedia talking book, DAISY standard multimedia talking book. So government are providing a low cost uh, multimedia talking book player like DAISY player which is developed locally. So I think it is increase the um, learning ability of the children with disabilities. And there is a study has conducted by the uh, University of Dhaka and we found it is really useful uh, when uh, children with the visual disability receive braille and audio both. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, yes, the gentleman in the back, please. Gabi Cohen from uh, Migdalor, Israel. We are trying to help uh, blind and visually impaired people to find jobs in the market. And we found out that many large companies have virtualized uh, environment which means uh, Citrix or Citrix or VMware and, and such, uh, uh, such, such uh, tools. So the uh, end user is using a desktop which is remotely connected to the system and we found out that the assistive technology does not work well with it. So it's, this is a question I think for standard standardization. Anyone knows how to overcome this problem? Who wants to take a crack at this? this yeah. It's more web standardization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th thank you for the excellent question. It, it is indeed a problem, um, particularly when we, uh, th there's a similar other situation also in enterprises, for instance, when security and accessibility conflict. Um, there are many situations, which is why I was trying to emphasize the user agent accessibility guidelines in here, also the emphasis on the end user tools. Uh, um, so I, I don't have a direct answer for you. This is more the operating system uh, level and issues on there. Um, uh, but the issue is that particularly now with, with, with web becoming more things like real-time communication and so on, entering more into the hardware also on mobile, for instance, where access to sensors and so on. So, so the, the boundary between operating system and, um, and web is diminishing. And so these issues that you're talking about are becoming more increasingly uh, a, a, an issue also for us at WTC and that we're looking into addressing. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's a tough one to crack. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it certainly needs more effort here. This is a majority of the, of the environment. And uh, you know, the application is running on a remote virtual machine. So this, this is a big issue. And most of the, uh, of the uh, jobs that we're trying to get to people, the system is not accessible and they cannot get the job. So I don't know. If, but I think this should be addressed really, it's really dramatic. So again, if it were web-based, it would, uh, it could, could be, may be better. But yes, virtual machines uh, on an operating system level does m make an issue because you don't have the direct access here to the peripheral hardware and, and, and the connection to assistive technologies can become really problematic. Um, so again, this is n not directly our, uh, I don't know if there's somebody from, from Microsoft here or, or, or from Apple or some of the other operating system vendor, Android maybe, uh, but, but this is uh, where, where the issue are and where more work is needed, yeah. Questions, please. Um, I don't. Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I was going to open uh, the the panel for one minute or a minute and a half comment by each one of the panelists. So, Vasco, why don't we start with you? Uh, uh, my my yeah, okay. uh, friends, I'd like to discuss one very important point. Uh, that is my previous few years experience of conference. As a visually impaired person, we always feel these types of big conference is fully inaccessible for a blind person. Even though I would like to meet some of the people, even though I would like to read, even though I would like to navigate, but nothing is accessible. You are around me, but I couldn't find you. I thought this conference we cannot enjoy fully. I think not this conference, all the conferences, including the COPS, 
we want to meet a big guy or any other persons, my friends, colleagues, but we miss them. They are maybe walking around us, but we cannot reach them. We, we cannot get the um, information on time in accessible format. So there is really, really a challenge. Every day, technology is improving. The barrier is increasing. If I see a modern five-star hotel, which is impossible for a blind person to navigate, where I am staying, it looks like a jail for a blind. Without anybody's help, it is nearly impossible to uh, move because the lift is not accessible, there is no audio, no braille, nothing. So we need to consider, I will request uh, to all, when you, whenever you go in an international conference, please consider the accessibility needs of the visually impaired people. So this is my humble request to everybody. Because without that, we are really ignoring, we are really uh, excluded to enjoy the conference like this. Thank you. Thank you. You bring up a, bring up a very important point. The UN also has a long task to, to, to complete the accessibility of these, of these installations. Um, so we will start uh, to, to my right with Mr. Schroeder, please. Frederick, if you, one minute, one minute and a half, please. Oh, thank you. I think the, the concluding message that, that I would bring will not be a, a great surprise to anyone in this room, and that is that blind people are not so much limited by their disability as by lack of opportunity. And unfortunately, lack of opportunity is a self-perpetuating spiral of, of damage and limitation in people's lives. When we talk about the Marrakesh Treaty and the ability to exchange materials in alternative formats or accessible formats, I think far too often people think of this as something nice for the blind. Won't it be nice that Fred will have a novel or magazine to help fill his lonely, isolated hours? And I don't mean that to sound as cynical as it probably does, but this is serious business. Literacy is the foundation to education, which is the foundation to many, many jobs. And so, please, uh, the World Blind Union, we have resources, but we need as many countries, we have about 33 countries currently that have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty, and, and I just encourage all of you, this is something that will make an enormous difference in the lives of blind and partially sighted people. Thank you. Very well put. Christopher, please. Yes, I, I want to talk briefly, um, close the IWP, but I also want to um, mirror what Susanna mentioned a few minutes ago um, in regards to procurement. Um, working at a university um, in the States, um, dealing with accessibility on that campus, it is very clear to me as an administrator that as I try to purchase things through the university, that I continue to get inaccessible ICT-related products and services. So that is where the bleeding is. That is where the bleeding is, and it needs to stop. Um, so I, I, I do mirror what Susanna said about that. In addition to that, um, I did want to mention um, some of the tools that IWP has. I, and one of them um, I mentioned is the webinars. And I mentioned that they were archived and that they were live. Um, these are done by experts throughout the globe. And we just had one yesterday um, talking about bringing CSS to um, CVG back into the accessibility spotlight. Um, last month, we had one that dealt with deaf and hard of hearing in the workplace. So do check them out. Do look at those resources. I think it's important. And just in closing, um, we talk about membership. There is a membership fee for IWP, and I, I wanted to bring that into the mix. And that we have professional types. There's three different professional types that we have. We have a nonprofit. There's three levels of nonprofit. And then we also have a corporate level. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that there was a membership fee tied to that. So thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, Tiran, please. Thank you. Um, I suppose just what the kind of takeaway, the common thread pick out from a lot of the contributions is the opportunities that technology can open up in kind of a wide range of areas. So Fred's just spoken about um, how opening up access to literature can have a lot of positive knock-on effects in terms of education. 
we'd look at um, mobility as an enabler of things like employment and also full participation in society. And I think given that we're on the crest of this new wave of technology around artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a huge amount of potential there to provide many more personalized services. Um, I know some people in the audience were talking about um, different approaches to learning, whether it's based on braille or auditory. And those are the kind of things will be much more easy to do on a more personalized level down to the individual user than is the case currently. And I think maybe what the responsibility of us is to look at what we need to have standards for, um, what needs to be personalized, and how we can leave room for people to go out and innovate and come up with new solutions that can change the world for people with vision impairments or other type of disabilities. And then how we can communicate that to the people in Chris's university who are in charge of procurement, um, how we can make every banking service as accessible as ING and things like that. Thank you. Susanna, please. So what I didn't <clears throat> talk about in, uh, in my presentation was what is all, another thing that is really interesting going on in Europe now is, of course, the Web Accessibility Directive. So from the 23rd of September this year, um, public sector websites are, and apps uh, need to be accessible and that is uh, extremely interesting to see what this European legislation, how that is interpreted and implemented in the different member states. And uh, coming from, from a rather uh, mature country when it comes to, to uh, accessibility, we see um, a problem with the legislation because we now have minimum requirements and, and we do see some, some potential risks that, that countries that have before worked with accessibility because it's the right thing to do and because they understand that um, that is really uh, a good way to move forward with the legislation. There is a very clear risk that, that instead we will sort of move backwards. On the other hand, we see very positive signs in other countries where there, at least the uh, recommendations or suggestions for new legislation, even if it hasn't been um, uh, closed or concluded yet, decided, um, they actually base their legislation uh, on on the directive from the European Union, but they also want to go, go beyond this. Um, and that is the case both in the Netherlands, in Belgium, the recommendations are like this, for example, also in Finland. Um, so that is really encouraging. And I, I do hope that this legislation will help pushing and getting focus on the question of accessibility, but clearly it will not be the only, uh, the only tool to make things move forward, but, but hopefully uh, we will have a bandwidth problem soon with too many accessibility experts needed and that's where we hope that IWP would help with certification and so on. But um, yeah, it's a complex uh, situation right now, but I'm, I'm hoping that the, that the legislation will be uh, positive for all of us. Thank you, Susanna. Jake? If you would like to start with accessibility within your company, uh, of course it all starts with um, creating awareness, but the next step is who will take on the accessibility role. Um, what, what would be a good approach is uh, it, it's, um, it's just like making popcorn. You heat it up and you heat it up and then one of them just starts popping. And that's exactly the person which you should give the role of accessibility champion. Uh, provide them in the opportunity to work on accessibility step by step. Don't want to do it all at the same time or all at once. And from within that, uh, the next one pops up. And uh, please provide them in the opportunity to work on it. Give them some time, uh, give them some help. And uh, in the end, they will do the hard work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, well, I would like to just maybe to conclude the, um, uh, and going back to my earlier presentation that uh, I learned a lot today about also there are many solutions available, uh, uh, but still uh, there is a st still limited adoption. Uh, and, and, and so I, we hope that um, at g 3 that uh, with our new tool, the, the, the DARE index, uh, this tool can help sort of measuring the gap and provide more data uh, with the help of advocates. So um, we, you know, um, I, I think this is my contribution for the time being for that. And uh, we look forward to um, 
receive uh, uh, observations as much as soon as we publish it <laughs> in March. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Shadi, please. Yes, yeah, so listening to the uh, round the table comments, uh, th there is obviously a lot of work to do on policy side, on uh, the technology side, on uh, adoption, implementation, all sorts of issues, education. Um, the same for standardization, so also from, from our perspective, part of ICT, the web here, uh, th there's a lot uh, ahead of us that we need to work on. There are a lot of gaps to close. Um, be it on the people side, we know that, for instance, people with cognitive and learning disabilities is a continual topic that needs more focus and more emphasis and more research and development here. Uh, at the same time, uh, also the, the convergence of technologies, it's an opportunity. At the same time, also a huge challenge. What do we do with uh, artificial intelligence uh, that is actually uh, looking to be like a disruptive technology coming in and changing a lot of how we act, how we uh, use technologies in general, and how uh, that will impact the web, or how the web can impact that, uh, or how can, um, they can work together. So uh, again, here the invitation to work together on this piece of ICT, uh, which obviously, from my bias perspective, is an important piece of ICT uh, that we uh, need to work on together. Thank you. Um, would you like to make a Yeah, just only five and comment. Yes. Uh, so uh, the issues, you know, um, I am now currently uh, trying to uh, make an inclusive digital Bangladesh, and we really require uh, the support from the international community as you have the knowledge and expertise. So we are in a very beginning stage of the um, digital inclusion. I would like to request um, whatever expertise uh, international community have, please come up to support us, especially uh, World Blind Union and uh, W3C, um, uh, please come up with your um, expertise, then we will be in a good position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd just like to conclude by, with an optimistic uh, comment. I think uh, since the approval of the convention, we have come a long way. Uh, this, this conversation we've had today proves that, that there is work in, that, that is being done and there's a lot of work to be done also. But I think we're very conscious of, the, uh, of a road map ahead. Uh, I think that uh, being an optimist at heart, I, I do think that people like the people who are on this panel will make a, an enormous difference to a community of billions. Uh, I would like to conclude asking you all for a round of applause to, for the experts that are on this panel and thanking them for their extraordinary work in their fields. Thank you very much.